we're, we're in the middle of this pandemic. The whole world and its wife is using Zoom. Even the Queen is doing her business on Zoom calls. I mean, without wanting to make light of the whole thing, surely we can get a Zoom connection to the Syrian camp? Absolutely. I mean, enough journalists have. I've seen interviews with the woman out in the camp, and actually she does not show an inch of contrition. She does not. She is not this sort of innocent uh, teenager that she is often painted out to be by sections of the left wing media in this country. This is someone who toured a terrorist fascistic state, endorsed its message, allegedly uh, sewed uh, uh, jackets that, that could be uh, planted with bombs, was was Com completely complicit in this evil, terroristic, fascistic regime. And the idea that we should be treating this as if it's run of the mill, as if it's ordinary, I think is worrying. And I think the precedent would be incredibly dangerous because what we would be doing was we would be saying to any uh, teenager with a flight of fancy of joining a foreign power to fight and kill British people, that it's fine as long as they do it before they're 18, they can come back and there's no problem and they'll be able to maybe have a light uh, slap on the wrists and there's no real uh, repercussions. I think that is an incredibly dangerous signal to send to this country and an example, quite frankly, has to be made here. Miata, should someone like Tom, in this case, feel more compassion for the plight of so, Shamima Begum? I don't think it's a question of compassion, uh, but I do think there is a reason why we don't have mob rule. There is a reason why people like Tom can't just form an opinion and decide that it is the rule of the law and it is right and wrong. These are opinions, it's conjectures. You don't have all the facts. We don't have all the information. We haven't had a trial. And I think it's really dangerous when we just use collective mob mentality to make these decisions. There's a reason why we have due process. There's a reason why we have a judiciary. So I think it's right that she should stand trial. And I'm sure she's, I don't, I don't know the facts and the evidence, but if she has done wrong, she will be tried as such and she will serve the sentence that's required. There is a question about whether she should have been made stateless anyway, because that is against international law, even though we claim that she was Bangladeshi, even though she's never been to Bangladesh and has no links to Bangladesh. We essentially made her lawless before having a proper trial to determine her guilt or innocence or what she did or didn't do, and then to ensure that the judicial process took its course and the right set of actions happened. There is a reason we have all of this. And if you use the extreme examples to undermine all of that, it is a slippery slope. So if it is right in principle, it is right. And Tom having particular views that are completely unfounded and rhetorical, etc., should not undermine that fundamental fact. Tom? But Mieta, I think that you're arguing against a straw man here. No one on this side of the fence is saying that she shouldn't have the right to appeal, that she shouldn't stand trial, that there shouldn't be due process. Of course there should. We're saying that she shouldn't be brought back to this country before that due process has happened. Because once she is in this country, she will not be able to be kicked out. So the, the issue here is that we must have a, a trial that doesn't presuppose its own outcome. She must uh, have that trial, but she mustn't come back to this country for it. She should uh, quite rightly as Dan says, do it down a Skype line. We're conducting this interview remotely currently. I don't see any reason why the same can't happen in the judicial process. Because you, well, you do accept, Miata, that once she's back, getting her out of this country because she is stateless, as, as you point out, is impossible. And the British public doesn't want her back if we can possibly avoid it. Well, if she comes back... And she, so the, I think there are two things that are being um, contested in the uh, courts. The first is whether she ought to be made stateless or not. And that's the thing that is being appealed. And that's the thing that she needs to have a presence in order to appeal. And then the second is for her to face the law if she has acted in a way that is unlawful against national security, terrorist crimes, whatever it is. So there are two things. Uh, and my view is if the courts must have reflected on all of this and if they came to the judgment that she needed to be present in order to defend herself on the claim of whether she should be made stateless or not, then that is right. Who am I? I am not qualified, nor have I seen the evidence and the information in order to question 
the courts that are the highest law in the land. My issue is more with people who are not qualified and are not part of our judiciary coming up with random views rather than the people that have deliberated over this and have no doubt thought about all of these dimensions and come to a ruling. And we ought to respect that. Well, of course, this is the court of appeal judgment, though, is it not, Tom? It is exactly. This is why the uh, this is why the Home Office, which feels very very strongly about this issue, is pushing it further, um, and it's going all the way to the uh, Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken, or is it the High Court? Um, it's, it's going to a higher court, and of course, that's the way that the rule of law works. We're not um, dem- we're, we're not ruling by diktat here. What's happening is a is the due process that should happen, but it's very very clear to me that this can happen down the line. It would be wrong and actually against the rule of law and due process to bring her back before that happens, because that would presuppose the outcome of the process that we're trying to engender. And in order to have that fair trial that could go either way, it must be done uh, extraterritorially. Um, because otherwise, there's no point in having the trial at all, because she will not be ab- able to leave the country. So I think this is really a, an open and shut case, in my view. And I think that uh, really looking at it in the next stage, I'd be, I'd be very surprised if this ruling today is upheld. And Mieta, with me, I would say this is a visceral, emotional reaction. Because we have had to live through in this country for the past few years some of the most brutal, horrific terrorist attacks conducted by ISIS, including the horrific, tragic murder of 22 people at an Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, including the terrorist attacks at Westminster, at London Bridge. And finally, we are saying, Miata, enough is enough. If you are British and you choose to leave the country to go and join ISIS or join a terrorist organisation that fundamentally exists to murder British people on British soil, we don't want you back on British soil. It's visceral, Miata. I get it. I get it. And it's not that I don't have those same emotions. Of course I do. Like everyone will feel very deep uh, anger um, at anything that is associated with terrorism. But I go back to the fact that there are reasons why we have laws, there are reasons why we have human rights, there are reasons why we have the judicial systems that we do, and I cherish those. And I think if you use the most extreme reactions where, you know, in your gut you feel that, of course, something is right, to undermine that, then it's easy to undermine it for anything else. So it is either right in principle or it's not. And if we say it's right in principle, then it's got to play out, even when it goes against all of our natural instincts. I mean, Tom, there's going to be a lot of people who are saying, well, look, the government made this decision. Surely they consulted the law and they felt it was an acceptable decision to make. It's not like this is just something that we have come up with. This was a government decision made by a very accomplished man like Sajid Javid as Home Secretary. Yes, that's true. It's clear that there is, uh, it's a contentious issue. It's clear that uh, her father was not British. There's uh, an argument to say that she does have dual citizenship. There's an argument to say that, hang on, why is the UK lumped with this? There's an argument to say um, that the example that it would set to uh, younger people today would be terrible. However, I would have to push back on that idea that uh, governments can be immune from the law. I think it's very important that we're able to challenge decisions that the government makes and that... uh, no, and I agree with that. Government I, I, I agree with that, but I guess I'm challenging you, Miata, in terms of saying that this is just something that Tom and I have plucked from thin air. I mean, at the end of the day, this was a decision that was made by the government to not allow her back, to strip her of her citizenship. And of course, I am not a legal expert, and the vast majority of the British public are not legal experts, but we trust our government on this. Well, I think that the decision that they made uh, was pretty dubious just in terms of international law Um, and I think there was a lot of politics at play Um, and I think there's a difference between decisions that are political um, and decisions that are based uh, on legality um, and on human rights Uh, and there's a reason why we have a distinction between our executive, our governments, our political sphere and our judicial sphere and it's for exactly these cases where the politics are also at play which means that the lines between what is legally right or not is a bit more blurry.
Miata Fanbula, the chief executive at the New Economics Foundation from the left, thank you so much. And to Tom Harwood too, before that, the writer at Guido Fawkes from the right.